us. If you would, take your Bible, turn to the book of Daniel chapter 6, and let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God. Daniel chapter 6, we're going to read beginning in verse number 1 in just a moment, and we are continuing our Overcoming series. I know this is Thanksgiving week, and yet we're going to study a passage that shows us how to give thanks in prayer, and we're going to continue the series, Overcomers. And I've entitled the message today, Overcoming Envy and Political Hardship. I have been saying for about five years that for those of us who intend to live for Christ in these last days, that it will not always be easy. Uh, somehow we've become accustomed to our freedom and uh, we've become accustomed to uh, the idea that uh, uh, we can have certain comforts as Christians. And that's just not historically always been the case for most Christians. And we're going to see uh, the impingement upon some of this, I believe, as the Lord's return draws nigh. And we need to have a right attitude and perspective towards the challenges that we face. And I can think of no one better in the Scripture other than our Lord Jesus than Daniel to help us see our way through uh, a time like we live in now. So I'm going to read the Word of God in just a moment. We're going to take a little bit more time in the introduction, so stay with me, jot some notes if that helps you, and then we'll get into the application of this message together. Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute. We might call this in today's vernacular a mandate. And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did for time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity to learn how to overcome the challenges we face in our lives. Help us to learn from Daniel this morning how to be steadfast in the face of cultural and political adversity, how to pray through, and God, strengthen our faith this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, oftentimes, one does not know whether he or she is growing in grace until we have circumstances which place us into a time of testing. Sometimes these are dark circumstances. Sometimes these are scary circumstances or seemingly hopeless circumstances. And it is when we feel all alone that we will either experience a measure of God's abundant grace or we will, in, in, in essence, fail of the grace of God and not experience that grace because we have not been growing as we should have been growing. All of us will have these tests and these times. And Daniel was certainly no stranger to challenges in his life. In fact, they had begun for him as a child. You see, as a child, he lived in the southern kingdom of Judah and due to the nation's sin, God had promised that because of their rebellion, there would come a time when they would be taken to Babylonian captivity. Isaiah told Hezekiah 
that Babylon would come to Jerusalem and take the treasures of the people and of the, of the uh, temple and that they would become captives of the Babylonians. And Jerusalem in the southern kingdom uh, is taken over to the city of Babylon. According to 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 17, the Bible says, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so we come to understand the issue of Daniel's captivity in Babylon. That dark hour for Daniel came about 605 B.C., when as a young man... He was taken as a prisoner of war, and he was taken all the way, 700 miles away, from his home. And certainly this was a great test for Daniel. Would he live for God as his parents had trained him, or would he adapt to the culture where he had been taken? The Bible tells us that Babylon in 605 took a small number of young men associated with the royal family as hostages into Babylon, and Daniel would have been probably a teenager at this time. Later, we read that in 586 B.C., the Babylonian captivity continued with the city of Jerusalem being completely sacked and ruined and many more prisoners being taken all the way to Babylon. Now, Daniel and his friends were brought to Babylon to be totally immersed in the culture much like the communist philosophy, where through indoctrination, sometimes teaching, sometimes rhetoric, sometimes music, however one is indoctrinated, it seems that oftentimes the youth are targeted in the indoctrination. And so it was that Daniel and his peers were targeted. They were given the names of Babylonians. They were given the diet of Babylonians. And yet, there were a few of these young men, these Hebrew children, who determined that they would not bow down to the gods of Babylon. And I want every parent and every teenager in this room to notice Daniel 1.8. What a great verse. What a great verse for your family to review this week. Take these notes. Go over it later. The Bible tells us about Daniel in this moment of world history. It says, but Daniel, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now here we see that there was a law upon Daniel for his dietary consumption, even for his religious practices, and yet it would take a determination on his part that he would not defile himself. And it takes a determination today, teenagers, that you will not defile yourself with the media, with social media, uh, with uh, marijuana, alcohol, whatever it is that this world would use to defile you, we must have young people today who would say, like Daniel of old, I will not defile myself with the portion of this world's meat or provision. You see, the men and women who have changed the world are the men and women the world could not change. And we need to band together as a church, as a Christian school, as families, banding together, praying for young people, encouraging them, admonishing them that they would not defile themselves in this culture, this wicked, abominable culture of the United States of America. Daniel, because of his faithfulness to God, I believe, was able to raise up and have influence in the Babylonian and Persian empires. Daniel was used greatly under Nebuchadnezzar when he gave interpretation to the prophetic dreams of Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel lived long enough ultimately to see the fall of the Babylonian empire and the rise of the media Persian or the Persian empire. I believe we have a chart that would indicate a little bit of the time frame that Daniel went through and we see Daniel being taken into captivity. Uh, We see Jerusalem being destroyed. Ultimately, Babylon falls as Cyrus comes in and establishes the Persian, Medo-Persian kingdom, of which Darius himself became the ruler. Now, it is in this new empire under Darius that we find ourselves in chapter 6. 
This is about 65 years after Daniel originally had been imported into Babylon. And so we see Daniel now as approximately an 80-year-old man. And yet, his spirit is still amazing. And by the way, men, as we grow older, may we grow sweeter and more excited and faith-filled in our God and his word. Here was a man, Daniel, who throughout his life had this excellent spirit. And we see that it was during this time that, again, people took note of his attitude. Wearsby says, Darius soon learned about Daniel and the reputation he had for honesty and wisdom, and Darius planned to make him his number one administrator over the entire kingdom. I believe someone said years ago, attitude determines altitude, and we know that God is the one that gives promotion, but many times uh, we find that men, teenagers, and women who have a, a positive godly attitude are blessed with opportunity. That was certainly the case in Daniel's life. Now, throughout Daniel's life, one of the reasons he was blessed was because of his ability to read the visions and the signs that were observed by these pagan leaders. He had the gift of prophecy. And we see Daniel's prophecy of the coming final kingdom. And that prophecy is something that I want to pause and take a look at as well this morning. Because the media Persian Empire, though an empire that was kind to the Jews, though they allowed the beginning of the rebuilding of the temple, uh, with Ezra. Uh, and uh, we see that though there was good uh, for the Jews during that period of time, that this particular kingdom with its two million man army was a wicked pagan kingdom with respect to the rejection of Jehovah God. And I want to say this morning that America is currently trending very rapidly, though we have a mighty army we are currently trending rapidly toward paganism. We are slouching toward socialism. And we are a nation that is on the brink of destruction morally as I preach this message this morning. For those of you that even took time to consider, to even consider and maybe read some of the tax bill that was passed in the so-called Build Back Better program, if you just took a moment to see this largest bill that has ever been placed upon the backs of the American people, a bill that our grandchildren and their children will never be able to repay, you will quickly identify it as nothing other than socialism. And if you'll stop to realize that now your tax dollars, which are used often for good purposes, will be used to support other people's child care uh, rather than the family themselves taking care of it, you will see that America is becoming quickly a very socialistic nation where people, instead of looking to God, instead of working and saving, will look more and more to the government, which is the typical pattern of socialism. People who no longer trust in God are now trusting in the government. People who say they want justice really want vengeance in this nation today. And yet the Bible says in Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It's not our responsibility to run out in the streets and try to get even for something. As believers, we know that God is in control and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So Daniel was living and prophesying in a wicked culture. And from time to time, he would speak into this culture as God opened that opportunity. In fact, Daniel prophesied of a final world kingdom where 10 powers would ultimately transfer their loyalty and power to one world leader. And we have preached about this before, but in your notes, you'll see that in Daniel 7, 24, and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue the three kings. Here we see that Daniel is literally writing about a coming world-ending empire. The apostle John wrote about this empire in Revelation 13, 17, and he spoke concerning this kingdom having a particular global type of currency, Revelation 13, 17, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark 
or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, many of us believe strongly that the current mandates are nothing more than a dry run for what will happen in Revelation 17. In other words, the idea of knowing who's had uh, various treatments, the idea of having universal medical records, the idea of having the technology that is rapidly developed so that we might keep track of every citizen on this planet. And while that seemed impossible 50 years ago, technologically, we see it advancing with each and every day. And this current pandemic has been a dry run opportunity to see how these types of records might be kept. And we see that many times as these things unfold, that you have Christians that are either A, very lukewarm and and inattentive and uncaring, or those that are more vigilant and discerning as they read and study the Word of God. Now the question this morning as we come to Daniel's life is this. What is the response of the believer when faced with such situations? Uh, Should we vote? Of course. Should we uh, be concerned? Should we voice our, our opinion? We have certainly a right to do all of those things. But there is one thing that seems to be forgotten by many Christians today in our busyness to voice our opinion, in our busyness on the internet. There is one lesson that I believe all of us can learn from Daniel. And that lesson is that true victory is always found on our knees. And that the power for victory in such times must always come through prayer. In short, we must dare to be a Daniel. We must dare to stand alone with our God. We need men and women in America today who will stand on their knees who will bring these matters before God in prayer. Let's learn a little bit about the necessity of prayer from the life of Daniel. I want you to notice, first of all, the mandate against Daniel. Every man or woman of God will face trials and attacks, and sometimes entire nations will experience mandates. And I want you to see this particular mandate that was given. It was a mandate that would be enforced upon everyone, but as you saw in the text this morning, it was specifically aimed at one segment of the population, we might say, and that was this praying Hebrew named Daniel. Now, I want you to see that these men, first of all, had an ungodly envy towards him. They, they had, if you will, a hatred toward him. The Bible says in verse 4, then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. This word occasion means they, they made up a reason. They wanted a pretext for speaking against this godly man. And I do not endeavor to speak Uh, in the sense of some type of flamboyance or creating some unnecessary fear. But may I say to you this morning that ungodly people will plot against believers in these last times. It was not that Daniel had done anything wrong. It was that he would not bend or bow on his religious convictions. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Daniel had taken his place as one who was doing what he did, who was living the way he lived for an audience of one. He was living in Babylon, now in the Persian Persian Empire, for the glory of his God. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 14, but if ye suffer for the righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Sometimes I've seen folks in the period of the pandemic and and, and they've been uh, so nervous and, and frustrated. Can I tell you, my friend, there's no safer place to live than in the middle of the will of God? Nations come and go, and nations change, and edicts come and go, and political parties come and go, but God will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. And we see that the Bible says that we are to not be afraid, 1 Peter 3, 15, but we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to anyone that asketh the reason of the hope that is within us. 
hey, you don't, you don't seem very troubled by all of this. You know, everyone else is riled up on one side or the other. Have all of you noticed that the media wants to get everybody mad at everybody else in America these days? How many of you have noticed that? But there are some people who can go through their day and actually smile. Let's smile at each other this morning. We can actually give thanks this week. We, we actually can live with peace this week. Why? Because we know that our God is in control. We see this ungodly envy toward a peaceful man. But notice, secondly, we see the faithful testimony of Daniel. The Bible says in verse 4, But they could not find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now, how many of you would praise God if that would be said of you? If people that you worked with studied your character, they said, this guy never gets ticked off. He never says a bad word. He has a good attitude. I just can't find any fault in him. What an amazing testimony Daniel had. He was a persecuted minority. He was one that was not living in his own land. And yet in that situation, he has this faithful testimony there was no fault found in him. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Let me encourage you in your neighborhood and at your work, no matter what pressures are going on, to, to walk with integrity, to have that godly testimony towards those that are without. He was a man that had trust that had been established with Darius Daniel was someone the king could trust wholeheartedly. He saw no flaw in his testimony. And I believe that every company and every, every neighborhood and every city and every family needs men and women that are trustworthy, that are consistent uh, for God. Luke 16 and 10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. God is calling us to faithfulness like Daniel. Here we see an ungodly trial, but we see in the midst of it a faithful testimony. And because of that faithfulness, we see then, thirdly, a jealous trap. These men begin to trap or seek to trap Daniel. The Bible says in verse number five, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They said this guy is predictable. He is predictable for his God. And so they are moving here to, to, to move toward uh, removing Daniel, even by death if it takes death, to get this religious zealot out of their way. Jonathan Edwards once said, envy is a spirit of dissatisfaction or opposition to the prosperity or happiness of other people. In other words, these men were so envious of Daniel, they could not stand the fact that this man had this position. They so hated him, they wanted to create a mandate that would exclude him from privilege and from the blessings of God. And so we see a plot is conceived out of jealousy. The plan is presented to the king. In verse six, the Bible says, these presidents and princes assembled together and they said unto him, King Darius, live forever. Here we see them flattering uh, the king, attempting to appease his pride. And we often see this in our politic in America today. And, and we see uh, this type of, of uh, maneuvering. That's what politics is all about. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 5, a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. And that's what they're doing here. They're setting a trap for the king. And they, they begin to lie. They said that all the rulers agreed on this. Notice in verse number 7. They said, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains have consulted together. And the fact is there was one that they had not consulted with and his name was Daniel. And so here we see conniving, lying politicians trying to get a mandate that would somehow benefit themselves. Never consulting with God's man, Daniel. You know, when the founding of this country took place, there were leaders 
who welcomed the participation of God's men, of the church, of Christians, who desired the counsel of godly men. But in this case, we see a picture of the present day. We see a majority of men lying to the leader, Darius, and never one time was Daniel involved in the consultation. And so the trap was set. Notice in verse 8, the Bible says, Now, O king, establish this decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Now, many nations would be allowed to change laws from one president to the next or one king to the next, if you will. But the law of the Medes and Persians, how many have ever heard that term? The law of the Medes and the Persians. It was deemed unalterable. This was not something that that Darius would be able to say, oh, I didn't realize that would affect Daniel. I'm going to have to change that real quick here. No, that's not how it worked. And these connivers knew that. They knew that this would be permanent They opposed Daniel, and they knew that once the decree was signed, that this would be the law for the next 30 days. And so, with the stroke of a pen, a mandate was created. May I say this morning that since the beginning of the pandemic, I have tried not to medically advise our church, and uh, I've not felt that to be my role. But I will tell you this morning that I have been strongly concerned with the mandates that have been forced upon people all across this land. I'm very happy that the 5th District Court uh, overturned the president's mandate, which would have affected institutions like our own church because we have more than 100 employees on this campus. It would have placed us in a position of carrying out the mandate of the government. I'm thankful that this week OSHA indicated and put on their website that they would not enforce the mandate. As I said, I believe these mandates are often dry runs for further power grabs and ultimately for the Antichrist. And I'm saying to you that while uh, we are inconvenienced by the present day mandate, that there may be those that come like this one where prayer was prohibited where religious freedom is impinged upon. And we as believers must be aware of the times and understanding of these directions. And so the mandate against Daniel was a mandate against his faith. And so we must be aware and vigilant to the fact that sometimes in the growth of socialistic power, there can be the infringement upon religious liberty. And that is a real concern in our country today. And so let us be aware of the fact that even as Daniel faced this mandate, it is not impossible to think that other mandates could come. And certainly there are many countries in the world today uh, with various forms of Sharia law and other types of law that outright bid the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the preaching of Jesus Christ. Do you think we could for one single second go to Iran or Malaysia and plant a New Testament Baptist church? It is forbidden. It is outlawed. And there are many countries today that have mandates that are against the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so mandates of any kind should draw our attention. And we see the mandate against Daniel was very clear. But notice, secondly, the ministry of Daniel. What does Daniel do in the midst of this? Does he burn a police car? Does he throw a chair through Starbucks? How many of you believe that Christians should respond differently when trials come to our lives? Notice, if you would, in verse 10, the Bible tells us, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, the mandate's made law here, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplications before his God and they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days save of thee, O king, shall be cast? into the den of lions. Now, friends, Daniel could have hidden his faith. Teenagers, Daniel could have acted like he wasn't a Christian. He could have had a secret little passageway on social media, a fake username. He could have found a way to pray in his closet. He could have found a way to alter his faith, to have some form of accommodating style of theology. And many Christians have that kind of faith today. And many churches have that kind of faith today. Rather than make the culture feel uncomfortable, they just bring the culture right in. 
And whatever the issue is, they adapt to the culture. And we will either adapt to the culture or we will stand true to the word of God in this day. And so I see here a planned prayer. I see that Daniel knew the law, he knew the punishment, but he consciously chose to obey God. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Let's say that together. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now here we see that this prayer was public. And I'm not advocating that you make a nuisance of yourself, but can I remind you of the fact, it doesn't matter where you live or where you work, you have the right and you have the God-given responsibility to give thanks for the food that you eat. It's okay to pray in public. It's okay to witness for Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility to go door to door with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The early church went publicly and from house to house. I'm saying that we see a man here, Daniel, who publicly obeyed God. He prays an intercessory prayer toward Jerusalem. He's praying according to a promise that had been given to the children of Israel. Second Chronicles 6 and verse 38 says, if they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whither they have carried them captives and pray toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers and toward the city which thou hast chosen and toward the house which I have built for thy name, then hear from the heavens even from thy dwelling place. In other words, God had promised, look at when you're in that captivity, if you'll turn to me and pray toward Jerusalem, then I will hear from heaven and I will bring you back into your land. And no doubt, Daniel had prayed this prayer for 65 years. And no mandate was going to stop him from praying to his God. Now I'm concerned about the current spirit of the mandates that we see in our own country, but I believe there are potentially greater and stronger and faith prohibiting mandates to come. And we'll continue to see a purging of Christianity in the process. Who will willingly stand for Christ and pray to God in heaven and attend a church that preaches a message like this? And who will find a more convenient way to do their faith? Daniel would not bend. Daniel would not bow. It was his habit. Did you notice the phrase in verse number 10, as he did aforetime? And I might suggest to you this morning that if you're not praying now, if you're not faithful now, if you're not witnessing now, it will take very little in the way of tribulation for you to completely stop serving God. Daniel was faithful in his life. Dr. Richard Halverson was the U.S. Senate chaplain when he spoke before a group of congressional leaders, uh, and, and they were irritated that the Congress had not acted with a stronger initiative to restore prayer in the schools. And to this audience who were seeking a greater initiative from government, Halverson asked this question. He said, how many of you have prayed with your children this month outside of a church building? Not one single member of Congress raised his hand that they had prayed with their children outside of a church building. You see, the problem today is not merely in the White House. The problem might be in your house. It might be in my house. You see, Daniel had it right in his own personal priorities. What makes a great church is hundreds of families who practice their religion at home. Can I get an amen on that? Dads, if you do not pray with your teenage girls and boys... Don't expect the school to just fix them all up for you. We must have a real faith in our family, in our personal life. Daniel didn't just pray at the temple. He couldn't go to the temple. It was 700 miles away. Daniel prayed to his God. It was a planned prayer. Adversity does not build character. It reveals what's already there. Here we see a planned prayer. Notice, secondly, there is a prepared persecution. Because he prays, the Bible tells us in verses 11 and 12, that the conspirators discover his prayer. They immediately go to the king. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 32, the wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. And so they bring this discovery to King Darius. They report this to the king. And, 
And Daniel, in this particular moment, did not regard the king's decree. And here, these men, these leaders of the nation, remind Darius of that which he had signed. He uh, perhaps did not even think of Daniel when he made this signature. And so Daniel's punishment is listed. And you know the story. Notice in verse 15, if you would. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Now uh, know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Here we see that these men bring Daniel into this lion's den. The Bible tells us that uh, these leaders roll a stone over the den. Imagine that. They place a stone over this den to keep this 80-year-old man from escaping. It doesn't matter if you are eight or if you are 80. If you fear nothing but God, this world will hate you. And this world will fear you. And so they place Daniel in the lion's den. The king's seal is placed upon it so that no one would help in the removal of Daniel. We see the ministry of Daniel did not stop during the persecution. The law, the mandate did not stop Daniel from praying to his God. And so we see the mandate of Daniel, the ministry of Daniel. But as we close this morning, I want you to notice the message of Daniel. What is the message he leaves for us today? What can we learn from this man standing alone in a wicked kingdom and standing for God. Notice in verse 18, the Bible says, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions. Notice verse 21, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me more for as much as before him innocence he was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and the king commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Here is Daniel in a place where no one could help him humanly. Psalm 37, 40 says, And the Lord shall help them and deliver them, and he shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Here we see a concerned king. The Bible tells us that this king Darius was concerned for Daniel. I find that curious. And I want to just say something, folks, and let me remind you this morning. God is always in control. Here was an unsafe king who had a burden for a prophet. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. When I consider the sovereignty of God, I do not want to become fatalistic and fail in my responsibility either to witness or even to vote or even to be salt and light in America. I want to stand for the truth but I want to do so knowing that no matter what the outcome may be, that my God is always and forever in control. And I see that in the life of Daniel, that God was moving according to a plan. We see here this concerned king. He fasts, he laments, he inquires for Daniel. He refers to Daniel as the servant of the living God. Now listen to me this morning. Those men and women with whom you work, if you are like Daniel, if you have a faithful testimony of integrity, they know that you're a Christian. If you are consistent in your walk with God, they're watching you. And this king knew that Daniel was, if you will, a man of God. But make no mistake that his referring to Daniel as the servant of the living God was not a profession of faith in that God. It was his observation of Daniel's faith. Uh, but it was not some uh, true profession. And we must not be fooled by politicians 
who say that they go to church, believe in God, or have had a born-again experience. There's a great difference between talking religion and truly putting your entire faith in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. We see a concerned king, not necessarily a converted king. Notice, secondly, a testifying prophet. Daniel speaks out in verse 22, and he says, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth. Notice the phrase, my God. I do not believe that Christians should practice using the name of God in vain. We should not go around saying, oh my, and then God. Or certainly we should not use God's name in vain. Can I get an amen on that? But in this sense, in this personal, possessive context, my God will deliver me. Isn't it wonderful that we can say, my God. It's not just the church's God, but that we have, as the missionary said a moment ago, a personal relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says in Daniel 3 and 17, if it be so, uh, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O Lord. We saw this with the three Hebrew children in chapter 3. We see it now with Daniel in chapter 6 that our God is our deliverer. It is not the government that will deliver. It is not an attorney that will deliver. It is not finances that will deliver. If there is deliverance to be had in your life, it will be God that brings the deliverance. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower friend in this day and in the days to come, look to the Lord for your deliverance. From the evil influences, from this intolerant culture, from the threats that will abound, we must look to the Lord for our deliverance. Missionary David Livingston was a wonderful Scottish missionary who essentially discovered and mapped the continent of Africa. As he came back to Scotland on occasion for a tour of speeches, he was gaunt and in poor health. His left arm had been crushed by a lion. He was asked if he would speak to these churches. He said to them, would you like me to tell you what supported me through all the years of exile among people whose language I could not understand and whose attitude toward me was almost always uncertain and mostly hostile, it was this. It was the words of our Lord Jesus who said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Pastor, the rapture could happen at any moment. Yes, it could. Pastor, uh, the signs of the times indicate that we're coming to the end. Oh, but here's the good news. He said, I will be with you right up to the end. I will be with you, Jesus said. Amen. And David Livingston said this was the phrase that kept him going and that kept him trusting in God. The world will often hate and be envious of Christians. But Daniel never desired revenge, nor did he show bitterness toward those, those that hated him. He just kept trusting God. He just kept believing God. He just kept being faithful in prayer. And I want to challenge you this Thanksgiving week that you set a time for prayer. If you've not had a personal devotional time, don't wait for January 1st, but start now at this time of the year and, and, and take time each day. And you don't have to open the windows and scream at your neighbors, but friend, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Find a place where you can pray. Dads, where your children seeing you praying and moms, where your children can hear the, your voice lifting up to God. And Daniel, as he did a four time prayed unto his God. Let this be a week of prayer. Let us take our burdens to prayer. Surely we'll talk of them to others. Surely we'll see things on the news. But Daniel teaches us that we must take them to the Lord in prayer. And I, I leave you with these two words. Pray and believe. Pray and believe. Daniel kept praying and he kept believing and when I think of believing, I cannot help but mention this morning our Lord Jesus Christ, who also was falsely accused, who also was placed into a tomb, who also had a stone uh, rolled over the tomb, and yet faithful 
to God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Father faithful to the Son. And on the third day, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph or his foes. God had been faithful, and we serve today a resurrected Savior. And if you have never put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive your sin and to give you a home in heaven, then I want to encourage you today to pray and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Listen, it's one thing to be saved from a lion's mouth. It's another thing to be saved from a fiery burning hell. And you can be saved by trusting in Jesus Christ for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are already saved, then I challenge you, pray and believe that God will make a way. But if you have never been saved, if you do not know that your heart is truly the home of Christ and that heaven is your eternal destiny, then I give you these same two words, pray and believe. But if we shall confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And this is why we must pray and believe. Let us stand together, shall we, this morning? Father, we have seen from the life of Daniel that we can overcome through faith and prayer. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our prayerlessness. Forgive us, Lord, for all of the time we spend talking to others and the little time we spend talking to you. And Lord, even in the face of this mandate, Daniel prayed as he did aforetime. So convict our hearts as believers, Lord. Help us to get out our day planners and our schedulers and schedule time to pray. And help us to believe that you will deliver us just as you delivered Daniel from that den. And God, if there's someone here that needs to pray and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today, the one who conquered death and the grave, we pray, Lord, that that one would turn to you this morning and be saved.